Hello everyone, welcome to the Apocalypse Review of 1917. This movie was first released in December of 2019, though many theaters and places like the U.S. didn't see it until January of 2020, and was directed by Sam Mendes, who also directed movies such as American Beauty. 1917 is a movie set in the midst of World War I, and it's in the action or the drama action genre. World War I was initially known as the Great War and the War to End All Wars. Too bad the latter name didn't end up being true, and it's no wonder that name didn't stick, as nearly countless wars and conflicts have taken place since. The conflict ultimately that ultimately came to be known as World War I took place from 1914 to 1918, and this film is loosely based on actual events in the war. Apparently, the inspiration for this movie came from director Sam Mendez's grandfather, who fought in World War I, who used to tell stories from his experience when Sam was a kid. The director, inspired by these stories, used artistic license to fashion this tale in the spirit of what happened during the war, and isn't specifically telling his grandpa's story. The characters in this movie are largely fictional, and serve to give a glimpse into a part of the war, rather than tell the tale of individual soldiers. So this is a historical war movie, but it's not a documentary. At the theater watching this, my experience was probably pretty dramatic compared with anyone else that's seen it. At one point during the movie, a lady starts screaming at the top of her lungs in the middle of the cinema. She was freaking out so badly that you couldn't understand what, if anything, she was attempting to say. It happened right at a point when a big character in the story seemed to be dying, so a lot of people initially thought she was just freaking out because she couldn't handle what was happening on screen and was literally buckling under the intense emotional pressure in the heat of the theatrical moment. The movie was stopped, lights were turned back on, and apparently what happened is the guy next to her started choking on his food and having a seizure. The lady with him thought he was dying, literally. The man, who someone said was only about 37, was taken to the hospital before the movie was fired back up. Thankfully, I'm told that he is just fine. Still, though, it adds some real-life intensity to the already tense situation on screen. So getting back to the movie itself, I actually loved it. I really like history and love the World War I era, especially since it's touched on so relatively little by Hollywood. This makes it extra interesting and learning details about it fresh, since we see movies themed around it so little. From a historical standpoint, it was very well done, and the way everything looked was very accurately portrayed and detailed. I'm really big on canon, and as a tale in this setting, it has historical canon that it must be in line with and pay respect to, and does a tremendous job of that. I enjoyed being submerged in that point in history for the couple of hours that it lasted. To me, the movie did a great job displaying the feel of the time period and highlighted the death, destruction, heartache, haunting beauty, and pointlessness of the whole conflict. Looking purely at the historical context of what was actually happening at that point in time during the conflict, pointless is what many would say is the point here. Some people say that is the epitome of that whole war. It started with the assassination of Archduke Ferdinand of Austria-Hungary. The assassin was a Serbian, so Austria-Hungary decided to attack Serbia and the Balkans. This set off a complicated network of alliances and old rivalries. Russia joined to protect Serbia and its Balkan allies. Germany then activated their alliance with Austria-Hungary. France had an alliance with Russia, who then joined the fight. Germany decided to send their armies through Belgium in an attempt to enter France through a less defended route, and Britain declared war on Germany under the guise of protecting Belgium. The Ottoman Empire, who had an alliance with Germany, then joined, as did England's ally, Japan. Some say that all this was just a pretext for something many of these countries wanted anyways, to settle who was best and who would be the dominant force on the world stage. Countries like Germany were rising powers that could have upset the world order at the time, and others like England were considered global powers with well-established empires. Historically, there is conflict when the current world power starts feeling threatened by a rival that is quickly catching up. Britain, for example, didn't want Germany to become the dominant force in Europe if France, and Russia for that matter, were defeated. France was looking to get back a territory from Germany called Alsace-Lorraine that had controlled until the Franco-Prussian War in the 1870s. Japan wanted to take more territory in East Asia and the Pacific, including territories and colonies held by Germany. Later in the war, the United States joined under the pretext of her supply ships bringing supplies to the Allies being sunk by German subs, which coincided roughly with the interception of the Zimmerman note from Germany trying to stir up war between the U.S. and Mexico, though making sure substantial debts owed by countries like England and France, who would perhaps not have been able to repay them, 
should they have lost, was likely a huge contributing factor. So you can see how things spiraled out of control rather quickly, like one big, messy, death-filled domino effect. It probably seems to most modern viewers of this that there was really no point from our modern perspective. Nationalism, the importance of growing and protecting empire, secret alliances, historical grievances on a local level, all things that most people now don't feel like are worth fighting wars and dying for. Certainly not a cause worth sending loved ones such as your dad, brother, son, or friends to die for, or making the personal ultimate sacrifice yourself for. Men of the Western world were wiping each other out with casualties that tallied up in the millions for many of the big powers, except for the United States who joined late in the war in 1917. There were times some of these countries lost over 10,000 people in a single battle, just one battle. Look at a map of Europe. Those are staggering numbers for such relatively small countries. Men were pulled from farms which lowered food production and caused many of these countries to have trouble feeding its own people. So the suffering was more widespread than just the front lines. And being trench warfare, there often was little traditional action such as storming beaches or taking an enemy's capital, capital city as the lines themselves moved very little. Most of the action was in the trenches and area in between them known as no man's land. Large numbers of men died in this area, commonly referred to as the Western Front, which is where most of the death and destruction occurred. The bulk of the trenches were roughly between France and Germany. So this is where I'm going to get into spoilers. So spoiler alert, alert you've been warned. So wow, with all that, there you have the overarching setting for the story. The movie here, though, just focuses on a section of the Western Front in France where the British were facing off against the German line in the trenches. The Germans are in the midst of undergoing a strategic withdrawal from a section of their trenches in the Western Front to new lines nine miles back that are easier for them to defend and are heavily fortified. The British, who don't realize the German plan, think they have the Germans on the run and send a battalion of 1,600 men to chase them and break their lines. Shortly after, British spy planes realize what's happening and that all these soldiers are doing exactly what the Germans had hoped they would and were about to be decimated. As Admiral Akbar would say, it's a trap. There was no good way to reach them as many modern communication methods didn't exist back then. So it's at this point that British High Command calls in two young soldiers named Blake and Schofield and asks them to deliver a message to this group to stop the attack, excuse me, in order to save these men's lives. Blake's brother is among the men about to fall into the German trap, so this is personal for him and the stakes are high. They quickly set out, uncertain if the Germans have even fully withdrawn. You get a feel for what the front looked like, at least on the British line, as the characters take you on a quick tour through their trenches on their way to their departure point. They are told of a way to traverse the complicated barbed wire fencing in no man's land and wish luck by the commander who says if they run into trouble in no man's land, no one is coming for them, at least until after nightfall, if at all. From this point on, death lurks around every corner. As they cross no man's land to get to the German lines, you see a complicated mess of barbed wire, mud, craters from mortar fire filled with the mutilated and decaying bodies of fallen soldiers, flies on everything, and even dead horses. So after slogging through the mess, death, filth, and horror of no man's land, they finally reach the German trenches, which they are relieved to find are empty and also damaged by enemy forces before pulling out. Burning embers from a recent fire tell them that they haven't been gone for long, though. Trying to find a way through, they work their way inside a bunker burrowed into the hillside where they find beds and even some supplies that got left behind. Schofield seems to be in awe of what the Germans had built when a booby trap is set off. Both men barely escape as the entire complex starts to come down around them. Outside, they see the remains of huge artillery pieces that were destroyed before being left behind and mountains of spent shells. Schofield, who was temporarily blinded by the booby trap, begins to break down and ask why Blake had to pick him for the mission. After hashing it out, they continue on their journey where Schofield lets it slip that he sold medals he's been awarded from previous battles for booze because he was thirsty and had declined taking leave because it was pointless. So this gives interesting insight into the psychology and mindset of the character. It's not long before they come across the ruins of a farm. Here you see everything is gutted out and a small orchard of cherry trees have been cut down. They are exploring the compound when a dogfight breaks out in the sky above. It appears to be two British planes chasing a lone German fighter. The German plane is shot down and comes crashing into the ruins of the barn where the enemy pilot is trapped in the wreckage of his flaming craft and is starting to be burned alive. 
So Blake insists that they pull him out and tell Schofield to go get him water. When Schofield turns away, the German pilot whips out a knife and attacks Blake. Schofield quickly, quickly shoots the ungrateful enemy pilot and kills him, but not before he is able to stab Blake right in his soft underbelly. Blake bleeds to death and makes Schofield promise he'll do everything he can to save his brother, who he says will be easy to find because he looks just like him. It was at this moment that the lady in the theater started screaming. Anyways, this leaves Schofield to find the battalion and Blake's brother on his own. He is escorted for part of his remaining journey by a British unit he happens to stumble, to stumble on, but then must traverse a ruined city crawling with German forces on his own. He eventually makes it to the battalion of 1,600 men who already started attacking at dawn. While the first wave was decimated, the attack is called off and the remaining soldiers are kept out of the meat, gr meat grinder, at least for one more day. Schofield is able to find Blake's brother where he briefly recants what happened and gives him some of his deceased brother's belongings as a small consolation. Not exactly a happy ending, but there wasn't exactly a happy ending to any of the battles in real life either. As already outlined, even when there is no action, you see dead horses, fallen men, artillery craters, mud to be slogged through, downed bridges, the finger-like tendrils of ruined buildings, there's sniper fire at some points, hollowed out homes, dog fights between planes in the air, and other signs and horrors of war of all types along with the fear of impending death everywhere you look. This is why there is so much suspense throughout this movie set amidst the haunting beauty of a world of a war-torn world. There was constant tension as it always seemed like something really bad could happen at any moment, and oftentimes it does. Personally, I was really shocked when one of the main characters died. I guessed from the beginning that one of them was going to bite the dust, but I just guessed it was going to be somebody else. It wasn't typical Hollywood horse estuary where you have a clear bad guy like Thanos or the Emperor or evil Russians or Nazis which must die in order to save the world and everybody is young and super good looking. This was just the nitty and gritty of the war, one full of more death than excitement. Mistakes cost lives and failing the mission could mean even more death and even your own ace. What you get here is just raw historical replication, and the occasional German soldier puking from over drinking while his friend is being choked to death. And yeah, that happened. <laughs> the story itself may not have been super exciting, but what I liked was the historical perspective. If I didn't like history and great visuals from this time period, this movie would have probably not been that great to me. However, I do love history, and this is an underrepresented era in Hollywood, one I was happy to see implemented here. This movie, 1917 that is, reminds me of another movie that came out last year. It was called They Shall Not Grow Old. It was also a World War I movie. Some may call it a type of documentary made entirely out of actual footage from the First World War. Like 1917, it was also mostly from the perspective of the British. But they were able to add color to the footage and sound. I love that movie too. This was obviously Hollywood, 1917 that is, not real footage, but I thought they were both great. As much as I liked 1917, it was mostly for the atmosphere. Having characters that were based on a real-life counterpart would have been a big plus and would have added to the emotion the film was trying to convey as you know whatever happened on the big screen really happened in real life. I would recommend this for anyone interested in the war in that time period. Anyone not interested in that will probably not enjoy it and I can't recommend it to them. I'll dock it for that lack of historical figures, but again, for being accurate to the time period in so many other ways, I'll give it the Matthew Bruski seal of historically solid approval. The scenes were all done incredibly well and looked historically accurate, at least the best of my knowledge, and will therefore give this a solid 8.75 out of 10 for anyone interested in this genre. This is the Apocalypse Review of 1917. Thanks for watching.